Started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third in a six part series of webinars really focused on youth mental health. Um, this series was born out of a summit that was solely focused on youth mental health that happened several months ago, hosted by the Annie Casey Foundation. Um, there was lots of energy and momentum that was cultivated in that space, and we wanted to keep that going. Um, so we're really excited to be here today to talk all about the stages of adolescent brain development, really understanding the journey of cognitive and emotional growth. I'm super thrilled to open up our space today. My name is Alex Lorbach, and I work at the Annie Casey Foundation, where I support our work focused on older youth who have experienced foster care. Um, before we dive in, just a housekeeping note that you should notice that there's a Q&A box. Um, please feel free to drop questions in there throughout the webinar, and we'll hold some space at the end of the presentation to talk through some of those. So um, but don't hesitate. We don't want you to forget them. Drop them in the box as we go. Um, and I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so excited about today's webinar because much of my work has been grounded in what we know about adolescent brain development. Um, this information is so valuable in the context of really shaping policies and practices that are truly responsive to and supportive of where young people are at developmentally. Um, and it's also, I've worked with young people who have learned about this information during adolescence and have felt really empowered to share this information with adults in their lives and actually use the research as a self-advocacy tool. And it's also been really powerful in young people's own healing and sort of reflection as they grow. And so um, I'm just so thrilled to have um, a dedicated session on this. And today to help us learn more about that is Dr. Adriana Galvan. Um, Dr. Galvan is a professor of psychology and the Dean of Undergraduate Education at UCLA. And she is super committed to improving the scientific understanding of the period of adolescence to create a more respectful and just world for young people. Um, in addition to that, she's also the co-executive director of the UCLA Center for the Developing Adolescent. Um, and I'll just read a, a little bit more info about her and then I'll, I'll hand the mic over to her. So she's a neuroscientist and her career has been focused on adolescent brain development and how it supports developmental milestones during the significant developmental window. And her uh, research expertise focuses on characterizing the neural mechanisms underlying adolescent behavior to really inform policies that impact young people. Um, Dr. Galvan has published over 130 scientific articles on the topic and is the author of The Neuroscience of Adolescence. Her research has been featured in several media outlets, some that you may have heard of, The New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, things like that. Um, and among her many recognitions in 2018, she was a Fulbright Scholar in Barcelona. And in 2019, she received the White House Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineers Award. So, who better than to have Dr. Galvan here to walk us through all of this. So welcome, welcome. Um, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you so much for your kind words. I was so inspired by that summit back in whenever it was May. So I'm happy to come back and hopefully continue the conversation. Just give me a second while I share my slides. And okay. Wait, hold on. Make sure that you guys see what I want you to see. Um, do this one. What do you guys see? Do you see and the presenter view or the just the slide? Just the slides. It looks good. Okay, great. Awesome. So um I today I'll be talking about some of the research we've been doing at the Center for the Developing Adolescent that builds on my own research in my lab and also uh, work around the world where we're trying to understand how this really normative and beautiful time of adolescence is supported by the brain. And what we've coalesced around is this idea that rather than thinking about the brain in pieces, like the prefrontal cortex or the reward system or the amygdala, um, and how those may contribute to, to mental health or mental wealth, we need to think about the connections that are emerging during adolescence that make it such a special period of life. At the Center for the Developing Adolescent, we are inspired by the intersectional opportunities to connect science, the lived experience, and storytelling, or rather how we tell the story of adolescence and the narratives that we may promote unintentionally about what it means to be a healthy adolescent, given the very diverse lived experiences that we know our young people have. So at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the framing piece that we work on. But before that, I'll um, aim to, to synthesize some of the work that the, the adolescent neuroscience community has been doing. 
grounding us in what we mean by adolescence, I think is really important. Um, it may be surprising to you to learn that we don't have a defined definition of what adolescence is because it spans such a wide period of life, uh, roughly about 15 years that is uh, jump-started by, by puberty early in adolescence. And this varies based on, on many different social and cultural factors, but generally 10, 11, 12 is when we start to see the emergence of puberty. And um, it spans through at least the mid twenties. And we base this on the, the findings that the adolescent brain continues to develop. And I don't mean that the brain keeps expanding in terms of size or something like that, but rather these connections I reference are evolving based on the experience and the input that we, that we feed the adolescent brain. And that's why it's so important to think about um, the environments that we create for our young people and the opportunities that we do or don't create for our young people that contribute to this connection that is going on in the brain. I highlight this slide, and if you were at the summit, I apologize because you probably saw it then too, but it is um, a, represent a representation of what I think is a really um, very characteristic time of during adolescence when there's just a lot of variability. The, all of these kids in this picture are in eighth grade and they're 14 years old, but you may notice that some of them look a lot older than 14 and some look much younger than 14. And this is just to illustrate the point that what is going on biologically doesn't always align with what how we treat young people and how we, um, the expectations or the assumptions we make about them. And this in particular varies by ethnicity or by um, socioeconomic status or stress. And that is just a reminder of the, the very um, tight bond that biology has with context and, and society to produce these individual differences. Adolescence is special for many reasons. And as someone who spent her career studying adolescence, I think they are fabulous and it is um, a, a, a time of, of a lot of enrichment. Um, but biologically and neurobiologically and contextually, there's a lot of rapid growth that's happening. Um, we're learning in response to our relationships and our experiences in the world around us. It's also a time where um, inv whereby investments for young people, and here I mean um, you know, financial investments, but also investments in terms of attention or the policies that we make that may or may not support young people, that these investments can pay off for them in their communities and help help realize the gains from earlier investments. About a decade or maybe now two decades ago, there was a large movement on focusing on early childhood because we know that a lot of development happens in early childhood and certainly that is still the case. Um, that recognition and attention to early childhood help us make significant gains in the policies that we enact for young, young children or newborn children, um, school-aged children. That same wave is now um, leading into adolescence. And I think that's um, long overdue and really important for us to think about how those investments also support um, people as they transition into adolescence and then out of adolescence. And as I mentioned when I was starting this talk, connection is at the core of healthy development. Certainly connections that are established within the brain and the growing connections that are established. And I'll talk a little bit more in a second about what I mean specifically about that. But the connections that are happening with communities with the inherent need to connect during adolescence. Often we, we observe that peers become very important during this time. It's not to say that they weren't important before, but the way that we, um, the attention that we place on peers in adolescence seems to grow and become amplified. And it's the connections with the self and identity exploration and development is at the is the hallmark of adolescent development. Adolescents have unique developmental needs, similar to how young kids, especially right after they're born, have unique needs and attributes that we instantly recognize, learning to walk and to talk and to bond with caregivers. Adolescents too have developmental needs. Obviously, they're not the same ones that are established and foundational early in life, but um, they are also based on natural, natural inclinations that adolescents have that help prepare them for the world ahead. These developmental needs include safe and satisfying ways to explore the world and to take healthy risks. Adolescents do take more risks. That's empirically based. They take more risks than younger kids. They take more risks than older adults. But it's not just human adolescents who do this. Every species in the world, whatever their juvenile period is that, that follows puberty, um, 
take risk to test out new ideas and experiences to leave the nest, so to speak. And creating ways for adolescents to do that is really important in our own species. We need to help adolescents have real world scenarios in which to build the decision-making capacities of the prefrontal cortex and the emotion regulation skills that are um, rooted and housed in the subcortical regions of the brain. Because they the, the way that these connections in the brain get formed is by trial and error, by practicing these skills. And here this picture is one of um, a new student driver because we know that's one of the new skills that emerges during adolescence, both because they, that's when they are old enough and that's when they are allowed to drive in our country, but also because that's when um, they may be um, building up to the to the prefrontal cortical capacities that allow them to, to make those types of um, more sophisticated um, skill building. Adolescents continue to need positive ways to earn respect and social status among peers and adults. Sometimes the narrative is that adolescents only care about what their peers think or that they're really focused on their friends, and certainly those things are true, but research shows that they continue to care a lot about what the adults in their lives are thinking or saying or the adults in our society are thinking or saying about them. And regions involved in social brain development are really activated by um, by signs of respect or equally signs of disrespect. And we know that our young people are really good at picking up on that nuance. Um, this too supports mental health. Young people who have opportunities to earn respect or feel that they are respected by those in their community are less likely to present with um, the, the commonly emerging uh, mental health issues during adolescence, which are, as you know, depression and anxiety uh, primarily. Um, I already mentioned this a little bit, but not just respect, but warmth and support from parents and other caring adults. Um, here, I'm thinking a lot about the warmth and support that can come from mentors or folks who are not in the home um, who can supplement or, or substitute for, for the warmth and support they may not be getting in other spaces. Adolescents need experiences that help define personal values, goals, and a positive sense of, of identity. Identity formation is paramount to adolescent development, whether that's gender identity or cultural identity, or, um, you know, as adults, we ask often a lot of our young people what they're going to do with their life or what they're doing later. And all of that feeds into developing um, a, a sense of identity. And we can better support this moving into a positive direction rather than sometimes um, young people questioning their, their lived experience or identity. And finally, avenues to develop a sense of meaning and purpose that allows young people to contribute to their communities is really important. There's a lot of research showing that when we contribute to others, when we feel like we matter, we have a sense of purpose, that is also um, a, a way to mitigate any uh, mental health symptoms or, or, um, or feelings. Often when young people, or any people actually, are experiencing an episode of anxiety or depression, one way that some clinicians suggest mitigating that is to go out and, and, and be with other people and, and contribute to them. And so um, providing those opportunities is really important. So those are the developed means of adolescence. And I went through them quickly because I think they are um, hopefully intuitive, but also should be named so that when we are thinking of how to support them, we should lean on and leverage, but they are naturally uh, gravitating towards. And the brain has a huge role in supporting these developmental needs and also supporting mental health. Um, we know from about two decades of research that adolescence is a distinct neurodevelopmental phase. And we may now take that for granted, but that knowledge was really built on many hundreds of studies using brain imaging um, and other biological metrics that showed us that adolescents are not simply many or many adults or overgrown kids, but that they are really um, undergoing a special period of, 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 of development that only exists during adolescence. One way I like to think about it is um, an example from younger kids. Kids who are don't yet walk, um, crawl for a little while, right? Most kids crawl between about six to nine months. It's a skill that we build up 
um, and kids only learn it through trial and error, but then they don't use it again. Obviously, all of us could probably crawl if we were asked to do it, but it's a skill that it only exists during that period of life or is used mostly during that life. It's the same with adolescent brain development. There's something very special about it. It's foundational um, and it serves a unique purpose. And that is in in our view at, at the Center for the Developing Adolescent, it serves a purpose of helping adolescents connect. And so um, the the natural changes that happen are also in support of mental health. So when I say connectivity, I'm referring to um, the, the literal connections that are happening during, um, during this window of life. So this is a glass brain that is an image taken here at the Brain Mapping Center at UCLA. Obviously in the, in the real brain, they're not color coded, these fibers are not color coded. But what you can see is that the front of the brain is connected to the back of the brain. And these connections are established very early in life. But during adolescence, the, the speed at which the neurons can actually communicate with neurons in a different part of the brain um, are, are um, amplified or sped up. And that that um, that increased connectivity among neurons helps helps adolescents make better decisions. It helps them respond to the world better. It helps the prefrontal cortex, for example, communicate with the amygdala in a situation that may be emotionally charged, for example. And so this connectivity is super important and one of these unique attributes of the adolescent brain and is not... Um, uh, is not isolated uh, to just happening in the brain. Or in other words, it happens in the brain, but it happens because of all the inputs that we're feeding the brain um, that help those connections. So I'll give you an example. Um, if there is a, an individual who is experiencing a lot of stress in their lives or um, a lot of trauma in their lives, the connections that are established for them may take longer to develop than someone who's living in a very healthy environment. Um, and there are many examples of that based on a lot of research. But the main point here is that we can better support the refinement of brain connectivity during adolescence simply, not simply, but by providing particular environments. You may have also heard the term plasticity in brain development previously. Um, plasticity refers to the idea that our brain cells are formed and strengthened and are responsive to the environment and, and to our experiences. And plasticity undergoes, there's a lot of plasticity early in life to support those very basic developmental needs I mentioned before, but there's a second wave of plasticity during adolescence when the brain reopens up how malleable it is to the to experience. And that is no coincidence. Nature doesn't make these kinds of, of you know, random um, decisions. Rather, it is in support of the new experiences that adolescents are, are going to have and, and do have. And so during adolescence, our brain cells are forming these, these connections with each other um, and um, more rapidly than in any other period of life other than early childhood. And some scientists say that this is the last great period of plasticity. It doesn't mean that later in life we can't learn new things, for example, but it does mean that we're better at learning them during adolescence or, or younger. Um, one common example that I think is some that resonates with, with people is the, the notion that we aren't able to learn languages as well later in life, or we will and we will have an accent because our neurons at that point are less plastic. Whereas in adolescence, we are better able to take on these, these new skills or to kind of redirect where our neurons form and, and what communication they have with other neurons. So this little image or this little video you're seeing here are brain cells literally reaching out to form connections with other brain cells. So this is just what's called one dendritic spine. It's that long branch that is reaching out to other um, to other branches near it that you can't see. Um, but that is happening in response to some particular you know, experiment that this, that this brain cell is undergoing. By the way, these are data from um, mouse models of adolescent brain development. It's not from humans. In humans, we do not have what's called the resolution to look at that granular, granular level of, of detail. But we know that the same things are happening in the adolescent human brain based on, on fMRI studies. Here's a cartoon image of that same idea. So what you're seeing here on the right are um, 
uh, dendritic spines on day one and then day two after there's been some kind of experimental intervention. And what you'll see is that there are places where there are, um, the, the branch is losing connections with other neurons and um, some places where it's gaining connections with other neurons. And so it's not bad to lose connections, but when be, and that happens in order for other connections to be strengthened. And at the microscopic level, our brain cells are literally reaching out to new information. And I, I, I think this is so fascinating because this is how um, our brain keeps developing during adolescence based on experience. Um, and it, as I mentioned before, it means that these um, neurons are forming connections with other neurons. Just to give you an illustration of how important this is during adolescence, around the time of puberty, our neurons can gain and lose about 25% of our connections each week. And this drops to 10% of connections by the time we reach adulthood. So that means that there's a rapid prol proliferation and, and pruning that happens during um, puberty, but then this wanes into adulthood. And that makes a lot of sense because it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be beneficial for our brains to keep changing so much as adults. We wouldn't ever stabilize on either a particular skill or particular identity, or I don't know, we're all constantly, I guess, changing, but it would be harder to hone in on stability if our neurons were constantly changing into adulthood. But during adolescence, it is an attribute. It is beneficial for us to be um, changing in response to the environment. So, um, you know, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit after I make another point about um, connect another point about some of the research we know. During adolescence, our brains are designed for exploration and curiosity. And that, so it's why I kind of spent a little bit more time on how our neurons reach out to new information because that reaching out and that forming of new um, new connections with other neurons, is what is what helps adolescents be so good at exploring the world, exploring new friendships, of standing up for causes that they believe in because their brains are literally reaching out for this new information. Um, and it goes hand in hand with their natural curiosity. Some some frame that as saying, well, that's their natural risk-taking tendency, and, and, and that is certainly true. Um, but that curiosity is what helps them learn and learn through trial and error about the changing world around them. One finding that's been consistently um, established using brain imaging is that our motivation systems and our reward systems, are, which are actually one and the same, are more active during adolescence. What you're seeing here on the right is a brain image of um, that, that is a summary of a lot of different studies showing the part of the brain that lights up when the person who's in, getting the MRI scan is seeing something that they find rewarding. And it, it's less important to see where it lights up, but that it lights up in the reward centers in the brain. And then also that there is a distinction between how much activation there is in the adolescent brain as compared to the younger brain and the older brain. So this um, graph that you're seeing here is research we did in our lab. Um, it's a cartoon image of the data analysis showing you that in response to a picture of, of money in this in this case, in the study, um, the adolescent brain is more active. Now, that doesn't mean that they value money more. We've done follow-up studies to know that. It doesn't mean that they were um, necessarily uh, maybe paying more attention to, to the money, although some studies do show that, but rather that in response to the very same rewarding stimulus, the adolescent brain is more active, that there is greater dopamine release in response to the same reward. And this happens whether you are presenting people in the scanner with money or with juice or with pictures of loved ones, the adolescent brain is simply more um, responsive to the rewards. This has been associated with the reason why they take more risks. They find the risks more rewarding and so therefore they're more likely to take them and that, and that certainly can be true. Um, it's also the case that they are releasing more dopamine in response to, to rewards. But what we find really particularly interesting is that the reward center of the brain, this dopamine rich region of the brain is actually also the learning center in the brain. And so not only is the adolescent brain designed for exploration and curiosity, but it is in reward seeking or reward sensitivity, but it is also designed and really good at learning from the environment. So 
I just threw a lot of information at you. So let me just recap a little bit. The reward center of the brain that is particularly active during the lesson is also the part of the brain that is responsible for learning new information. And so that means that if, if this brain region is more active during rewards and during learning, that's what helps adolescents learn certain things more quickly than, than even adults. Um, this uh, graph that you're seeing on the right is a representation of that. With uh, collaborators I have at Columbia University, we did a study with a group of adolescents and a group of adults in which we asked them to get their brain scanned while they were learning something new. Nobody knew what they were learning, not the adolescents and not the adults. Early on in the experiment, as you can see here in the first 30 trials, the adolescents and the adults performed equally well at about 65%. By the end of the experiment, the adolescents here shown in blue were um, have it showing us about an uh, almost 90% accuracy on this learning task and the adults were about 70%. And so what this told us is that the adolescents were better than adults at learning the associations we presented to them. Our hypothesis was that it was because their reward center, remember, which is also their learning center, was more active during the experiment. And that's exactly what we found, that um, in this image, you can see on the bottom a comparison of how much activation there was in this dopamine-rich region called the striatum in adolescents on the left and adults on the right. And you can see that the adolescents visually, you can see, had greater activation. And we quantified it and made sure that this wasn't, wasn't a spurious result. Um, but the learning system in the striatum was greater and, and more engaged in the adolescent group. And also, um, we found the same uh, pattern of difference of activation in the hippocampus, which you may know from, from, your, um, from your awareness of what the learning centers in the brain are. Um, the hippocampus is the primary learning center. It's a primary memory center. And so both learning systems and our experiment showed that adolescents showed greater activation in these regions and that it was associated with learning. So why am I talking about learning so much? Le I'm talking about learning because one of the key attributes of adolescence is everything I've said about puberty and about connection and all those things, but it's about learning a new social landscape. We learn we're in new spaces in, in school. We are forming new relationships with our, with our parents, with our caregivers. We are forming new relationships with new people. We're learning about new, new activities. So I don't just mean learning in the classroom, although that's really important too, but just learning about the social world, learning how to be an adolescent and transition into it and transition into adulthood. All of this requires that our brains are picking up new information and building new skills. And so if the brain is primed to do this at a really rapid, efficient way, then we should celebrate that. And we should leverage that type of learning capacity among young people. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the social brain and why we care so much about earning respect and connecting with others and feeling uh, understood. And this happens because of the changes that are happening in these brain regions here. I won't go through them because again, labeling different brain regions is actually not as important as understanding that the un undergo changes. Um, but I'll just put this up in case anyone's interested and, and I can of course share my slides. Um, so we know that connection is at the core of healthy development is in the ways that I've discussed before. But one thing I haven't talked about that I think is really important for a discussion on mental health is the importance of supporting mental health through connections and, um, and sleep. A lot of our connections in the brain happen while we are asleep, actually. So in the same way that we know that young, young babies grow physically a lot um, when they're sleeping, and we know that sleep is restorative for our brain. Um, it also is directly related to how well our brains are connecting and, and building up those, those connections. And the reason it matters for adolescents is the National Sleep Foundation has named sleep as a basic need that suffers during adolescence. We've all heard the recommendations that we should get about eight hours of sleep. Our young people, not just in this country, but in, around the world, 
um, have successfully gotten less sleep across generations. And there are many reasons for this. I'm sure some of them you immediately come to mind that I'll talk about in a second. But, the, but I want to just underscore that it's a basic need in the same way that we need food and water. We need sleep. We, we know that we sleep about 30 percent of our lives and it's no coincidence that we do that. And we know that sleep is related to a host of things like learning, uh, mental health, um, you know, skill building, all of the all of the things we know happen during adolescence. This happens for a very variety of reasons. Um, the last bullet is probably one that you were thinking of that kids use more technology before bed and that may interrupt and disrupt their, their sleep. And that is certainly true. But there are also some biological reasons why sleep suffers more during adolescence than in any other time in life. Um, one is that circadian, there are what are called circadian sleep delays related to puberty. So that means that when puberty strikes, the way that our brains respond to light, like light in the world, um, changes. So you might not be able to see it, but there's this teeny tiny little circle in the middle that's a, a pink. And that is a nucleus in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the SCN is what regulates our sleep wake times. So when the sun goes down, your suprachiasmatic nucleus tells you that it's time to go to bed because it starts releasing melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. Well, this not so during adolescence. During adolescence, when the sun goes down, melatonin does not start getting released until about two hours after it happens in adults. And so that means that that sleepiness hormone is actually delayed during adolescence. And so that's one reason that they sleep, um, that they're not as sleepy at the same bedtime as adults are. Another reason is that these circadian sleep delays make it so that adolescents actually are more active at night than adults. So there's a lot of research on, um, in, again, in humans and in other animals showing activity levels. And whereas adults start to kind of decrease their activity levels, physically decrease their activity levels, um, adolescents don't show that same pattern. And so they their, their brains and their bodies want to keep working and going um, later into the night. So this impacts their bedtime. Obviously, they go to bed later. And both because of what they're doing and because of the biology of what I just described. But meanwhile, their wake times are the same because they go to school and our school systems are based on a particular um, school start time, right? There's changing and there's variation, but in general, adolescents are still getting up at the same time as they did when they were younger and yet they're going to bed later. Why does this matter? Um, I already mentioned all of the things sleep is associated with, including general health, mental health, well-being. Um, it supports our ability to emotionally regulate. This certainly isn't just true in adults. We all know that when, when we're not sleeping well, we may be just more emotionally reactive to things that don't bother us so much when we have gotten a good night's sleep. Um, and for a group of people who are still developing in their emotional reactivity and regulation systems in the brain, this impaired sleep is going to impact them more in terms of their ability to compensate for, for um, <clears throat> and make up for that lack of sleep in their emotion regulation. Um, as strong links to reckless driving, and I only bring it up because of what I mentioned earlier, that driving is one of those very new skills that emerge during adolescence. Um, and if they're not getting enough sleep, clearly it's gonna be impacting the skill that they're not they're not yet um, as, as, as skilled at as adults. I won't unfortunately have time to talk so much about the implications for policy, but um, there are a lot of interesting conversations about how sleep intersects with school start time. And then also my personal interest in, in collaboration with a colleague in Texas is on how um, sleep is compromised in young people who don't have a stable sleep setting, either because they are um, moving between homes or because they have their um, housing insecurity circumstance makes it so that they don't have a, a stable place to sleep or they are in juvenile detention. All of these spaces do not make for um, stability in sleep. And that is actually the number one way to get good sleep is to have stability both in place and in time and environment um, when you sleep. I know that because we've done some research that was generously funded by the William T. Grant Foundation that um, aimed to examine the link between sleep and sleep variation and, and uh, connections in the brain that, that are forming that I mentioned earlier in the talk. 
And so what we did is we went into um, homes all over Los Angeles that varied on socioeconomic status, on neighborhood, on, on many different factors. And what we collected while we were in these homes of these young people and their families was um, their, their sleep environment, the temperature in the room, the light in the room, how many sleeping partners they had, how much technology used before bed. And so we did all this in-house assessment and then we came back to the laboratory and a few weeks later, they came with us and they um, got a brain scan. And we just measured whether there was a correlation between all of these factors and their, and their brain connections. And what we found, as you can see on this image here, whatever comes up, is that, um, is that those who got worse sleep, which you're seeing on the x-axis and here labeled as sleep disruption. Oh, and by the way, we collected um, sleep data using an actograph watch that tells us not just how long they were in bed, but how much movement they had, how many times they woke up during the night, that kind of thing. And those who had worse sleep, that is wor more sleep disruptions, showed less or diminished connectivity among the brain regions we know typically are um, showing a lot of brain connectivity. The opposite was true of those who had minimal sleep disruption. So those adolescents who either um, slept a, a, a lot or you know around seven to eight hours a night, who had a consistent sleep schedule, that is they went to bed roughly at about the same time and woke up roughly at about the same time, <clears throat> those with the minimal sleep disruption had better connectivity. That is that the brain regions that are starting to make those, those connections with other brain regions showed a healthier pattern of development. Um, and, and that was after excluding a lot of different other factors that may have contributed to the, to the kind of connectivity in the brain, such as IQ and things like that. We dug in a little bit to the data about what was causing the sleep disruption. We initially thought it was that those who had worse sleep were the adolescents who were um, using more technology before bed. That's not what we found. And it's not to say that technology doesn't matter, but in our study, probably all the students or all the kids or all the adolescents um, already had a high level of, of technology use. And so there wasn't enough variation to capture that, that nuance. Um, perhaps it was the light in the room or the noise level in the neighborhood. Not, neither of those actually related to sleep disruption either. What surprised us is that the relation to sleep disruption was actually accounted for by, by the comfort the adolescents reported having in terms of their bedding, their mattress, and their pillows. And so what we found is that young people who reported having more comfortable sleep environment um, it, by having a comfortable pillow were the ones who had least sleep disruption. And this was agnostic to socioeconomic status, to neighborhood, to all the other factors that I mentioned. Um, and I like to highlight this finding because we often try to think about policies that would support better sleep. And, and our preliminary data on this suggests that if we found a way to get young people a good pillow, whether or not they had higher or lower resources, um, this may help um, improve brain connect connectivity and then subsequently all the other factors that are associated with, with good sleep. All right. So, um, so. Given this information, how can we support the adolescent adolescents and the connecting adolescent brain? And so we've thought long and hard about it at CDA, and they're pretty simple suggestions I'm about to have, but I, I'll, I'll list them anyway. One is to invest in adolescents and research on the adolescent experience. It's growing in terms of how much we um, support young people through through these kinds of investments and attention and resources and financially. And certainly um, foundations such as the Annie E. Casey Foundation support this kind of work that is so crucial, but also investing in adolescents at the federal level. Um, we did recently a policy scan or a, a scan of, of the state of adolescence and, and um, how much attention adolescence gets in this country. And we were surprised to see that, um, you know, for example, there are no adolescent, there's no caucus in government that focuses on adolescents. There's a caucus on mental health. There's a caucus on young kids. There's a caucus on older people. Um, but just the period of adolescence does not have that kind of representation in government. Um, I think that speaks to how much we do or don't invest in adolescents. In 2018, there was a series of articles published in the journal Nature, and I was really taken by this editorial, of which I've taken a snippet to, to highlight the point. And they said that a modern healthcare system without a focus on the unique challenges of 
pediatrics or geriatrics would be unthinkable, yet there is no similar effort on behalf of adolescents. I find that striking because adolescents constitute the most growing number of people. They constitute about 25% of, of this world globally. So, um, so we need to do better in terms of investment. Using science to identify ideal points of intervention, prevention, redirection is something that we're still working on. So I'm often asked, well, when is the best time to um, you know, intervene with, with a young person who's struggling with, let's say, depression? We don't know that yet. We don't know what the best time is. Is it 14? Is it 16? Is there a number associated with it? Is it a capacity? Um, and so we can do a better job at supporting adolescents by, by using what we know about plasticity to um, <clears throat> to invest our limited dollars in a particular way. Celebrating adolescence is really important. So um, it's super important to, to lift up the, the challenges that they may have, but also to lift up the, the ways that they are changing the world. They're at the forefront of many things. And so um, rather than simply having a lot of stories in the New York Times, in NPR, in the Wall Street Journal about um, what's wrong with adolescence or what even if it's done in this in the service of concern, it does promote this narrative that adolescents are broken, and that is um, antithetical to how we can celebrate young people. Along with that, paying attention to more than adolescent social media use, and this should also say <clears throat> mental health is really important. Those things are very important. And there, you know, there's a lot of um of of research aiming to determine what is the link between social media use and mental health. And that's really important. But there are many other things that young people are, are thinking about that may contribute to their mental health. Um, my colleague, Andrew Fellini and I, who, uh, who uh, with whom I run the, the center, recently published this article in Nature last year, it's now been a year. Um, and the, the entire point of the article was that young people need experiences that boost their mental health. So rather than the reaction to mental health, um, what are the what are the needs that adolescents have based on what we know of their developmental needs? What kinds of experiences can we promote, such as contribution, such as identity development, that um, help front load mental wealth ahead of the mental health problem? So in my last few minutes, I'll just briefly touch on um, some work we've been doing with the Frameworks Institute on the importance of framing adolescence. So what we say about adolescents matter, and um, not just because it influences um, what we think, but also how we feel about young people. So um, this is an article that Nat Kendall Taylor, who is at the helm of Frameworks Institute, published with, with Dr. Fellini. Um, and I really urge you to read it. I wish I had time to go into what the article says, but basically what they're saying is that the story that we're telling about youth mental health may be hurting our kids. So in other words, if we present this narrative that it's impossible to fix, then people stop paying attention. If we present this, this notion that young people are doomed if they experience mental health crisis, then we are also not helping them. And so again, I encourage you to read this in Newsweek. But what I'll say here today is that, um, they, uh, the Frameworks Institute gives very simple tips for how we can support a new narrative about adolescents. One is to advance a positive vision for all adolescents. So use the collective we. So when we say they or adolescents do this or they, 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 we are othering them, right? And we may be particularly excluding particular adolescents. And we have all been adolescents, so we can actually use this in a way that's, that's accurate. Um, we want to explain and not, not describe equity in, in, in structural factors. So in other words, don't just name that there are differences based on you know, SES or something like that, but explain the structural inequities that lead to that, that kind of um, that uh, difference. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna give you a few examples that, um, that really illustrate the, the points of frameworks that we try to adopt. So often there is, um, uh, a discussion about how adolescents are prone to peer pressure, for example. So framework says, instead of saying younger adolescents are particularly vulnerable to peer pressure because yada yada, um, saying that is not helpful because it cues this idea that peers matter more than adults. It cues this notion that this is a dangerous time for adolescents, that peers are actually dangerous for adolescents, which we, we know is not true. It, 
may be true for some people, but for a lot of people, peers are actually very positive. Um, so instead of saying that narrative, say in early adolescence, we are developing skills, yada, yada, and there needs to be space for positive engagement with friends and supportive adults. <clears throat> Another example, um, explain, don't describe structural factors that lead to inequities. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but for example, leading with adolescents from communities of color often have lower high school graduation rates than their white peers. What that does is it pathologizes racial difference. It um, suggests that there is, um, you know, nothing that, that can be done. It doesn't. It doesn't describe what frameworks suggest that we should describe instead, and that is to describe why this has happened. One impact of the history of racial racial segregation is that schools that serve communities of color tend to have less funding and fewer resources. This is one reason why this may, you know, X, Y, or Z may happen. And then just um, one last example, um, start with social emotional development and identity formation. So when you're describing the changes that happen in the adolescent brain, um, rather than cueing a black box or a dangerous time or that biology takes over and we have, we have no, nothing that we can do as a society, um, say things like the changes that occur between puberty and the mid twenties <clears throat> create a period of intense learning about who we are and who we want to be. And again, cueing this idea of learning, um, which is oriented towards the future. Okay, so I'm going to, um, okay, th th this really is the last one. <laughs> that um, when, we, when we frame adolescence as a time when we learn by trial and error, um, when we frame it as a time when we begin to explore the world, that then what we're doing is reminding us that that adolescence is a laboratory of social learning and that we can scaffold that learning by providing particular um, resources or opportunities. So I'll just close by saying that um, we work closely with the National Scientific Council on Adolescence and we produce council reports. Um, this is uh, one we did last year. It was our first one on the intersection of adolescent development and anti-Black racism. Um, it describes how um, anti-Black racism, it, it, the particular ways that anti-Black racism impacts young people, um, both by uh, the structural factors and interpersonal factors. Um, and it provides four key social contexts of adolescence whereby we may help um, young people in this space through peers, family, schools, and community. And again, I won't have time to go through that council report, but I highlight it here and hopefully you'll, you'll find it um, on our website. Um, our next uh, council report coming out of CDA and the National Scientific Council will be on cultivating purpose. Um, this morning we met about the one we will be producing about puberty and how puberty is not just biologically based, but it is hand in hand and intersects deeply with, um, with society and, and community. Um, and then finally, we'll have one on mental health. We'll do a brief series on um, one that supports uh, or provides information for middle school educators and others for, um, uh, for, for people who work with adolescents at different stages. And so with that, I will close. So I had some time to answer some questions, but here are some um, ways to get in touch with us. And I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you and look forward to um, connecting further. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, this is all so fascinating. And I feel like every time I engage with this research, I go one level deeper in my thinking, right? Like really from understanding what's happening during adolescence, implications on policy and practice, and also really thinking about, yeah, how we can reshape this narrative about adolescence to one that is really grounded in growth and possibility and hope and opportunity and all of these things that are actually really powerful, right? Because to your point, how we view young people in adolescence profoundly shapes the way we structure society um, in yeah, a way that exactly. and, and it's a tricky line to walk because we certainly don't want to minimize the very real challenges that many young people face. Um, but how can we just in general start at a baseline that is positive and then move from there rather than the other way around, right? Rather than saying, well, what, what, what is good about them? Just making that assumption that there's a lot of greatness there. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And knowing that 
right? Nothing about humans is black and white. Um, I think right. I mentioned this on the last the last webinar, but like we exist in this blue and gray, right? But I yes, I think grounding in a new a new bar a new baseline narrative is, is really exactly. powerful. And for young kids, we really accept the fact that they learn through trial and error. Like I said, with the crawling and the walking, we don't, you know, a, a, a one-year-old who's learning to walk falls about a hundred times a day. We don't say, well, that was stupid. You know, we don't, we know that this is the only way that they're going to learn. And there are some, some similar principles in adolescence. Yes. Yes. No, I love that. I love that. Um, and I know folks are grappling with that too, people who are listening. So if people have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat or in the Q&A box um, and I'll read yeah. them. And of course, we'll share the recording um, and the resources mentioned. Um, yeah, there's a few questions about um, slides. Yes, I'm happy to share my slides. So maybe who should I send them to? To you, Alex? Or Yeah, sure. We can figure it out. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to figure it out and we'll, we'll yeah. get them out to people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see another question in here. Um, curious. So what do we know? Um, or is there anything to share about the impact or influence of marijuana on brain function and or overall brain development? Yeah. I know this is a hot topic. It's such a hot topic. And it's such an important question because I didn't have time to show some trends about how adolescence itself is changing across successive generations. And one way it's changing is that there's a much less use of alcohol, which is what, you know, was prevalent in 70s, 80s, and 90s. And now it's marijuana for obvious reasons, right? Marijuana laws have changed, et cetera. Um, the jury's still out. There are some studies on it, but the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study, the ABCD study, funded by the NIH, it's the largest study to date in the world of adolescents. And it includes 10,000 adolescents who were enrolled um, at age 10, and we'll follow them through age 20. There are sites 23 sites all over the country. Anyway, that's going to tell us the most that we have because it was intended and designed to address that very question of how is marijuana um, impacting brain development. For now, we know that one, that it does. And so that is actually an important thing to name because, you know, the, similar to a lot of things, the narrative that we've heard for so long creeps into our assumptions. And the narrative that marijuana is not harmful is untrue. And in particular, um, in regions that you would suspect, the learning regions, the memory regions, those impact, um, marijuana impacts those brain regions the most. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that and for um, sharing the, citing that source so folks yeah. um, can look into that as well. Um, another question about existing studies um, or sort of what we know, is there anything um, out there that you would point to or any insights that you might share that focuses on what happens um, regarding brain development during adolescence for adolescents who experience trauma during adolescence and really looking at resilience um, or sort of different facets of what those experiences might be? Yes, thank you for this really great question. There is fantastic, um, really sophisticated work on this question because we, we know that uh, these people in particular need our support. So I will point you to, um, so a few scholars who do this research, it's um, Nim Tottenham, she's at Columbia, um, uh, Margaret Sheridan, she is at UNC, uh, Dylan G is at Yale, and um, Katie McLaughlin is at Harvard, and all of those scholars have exactly studied this question. And what they do find is, just to answer the question briefly, um, is certainly that the type of trauma matters, the duration of the trauma matters. So as with anything, removing the the child from a traumatic experience the earlier the better um because that you know it's kind of a dose dependent effect so the longer it goes the more trauma in particular brain regions um but when i mentioned in my talk that adolescence is in the plasticity during adolescence is so important for redirection that's kind of what i was referring to implicitly is that any previous trauma that was experienced um, there's hope that because of the plasticity of the brain that we can help um, re reestablish healthy pathways in, in these regions that are impacted. Yeah, thanks for offering that. I I sort of think about like the neuromagic that exists in adolescence. Um, oh, I love that, that term. That's so great. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if, if I borrowed that from somewhere unconsciously, but that's always like in my head when we think about mm -hmm. healing and growth and just like really, truly the possibility that that does exist in that space. So thank you for yeah. speaking to that. Um, another question that I'm seeing, so you really talked about how adolescents, um, uh, you know, making connections and being, um, 
having meaningful relationships and growing your social network and all of that is really, really impactful on development. Um, is there any research on how the COVID-19 pandemic and social isolation has impacted adolescent brain development? Yes. So scientists quickly mobilized, mobilized during COVID to address this question. And to be honest with you, I, I'm not as familiar with the with the work on the findings on that. They're still coming out, as you can imagine. Um, one finding that was particularly interesting is that, yes, the isolation and the loneliness piece is so um, impactful for young people who, as I just described for an hour, they need connection. And so during this time, they, they didn't get it. What's interesting is that there was an uptick in depressive symptoms, um, probably because of the isolation, but there was some data suggest a decrease in um, symptoms of anxiety. And so it's really interesting to think about those who were anxious or probably anxious because they were interacting with social things or things that made them uncomfortable. Um, and they didn't do that during COVID. So that was going to minimize that, but certainly it related to um, depression. Thanks for speaking to that. And I'm sure we'll learn lots to come as, as time goes on on that. Um, I'm seeing another question. Is there any research yet on how bans on gender affirming care impact adolescent neurodevelopment? Yeah. So important. Thank you for asking that. No, I don't know the. I don't know how um, the rec There aren't studies yet on how it impacts adolescent neurodevelopment. But as I mentioned, I was meeting with the um, council this morning, and we were talking about our next council report on puberty. And this is certainly a topic that needs to be front and center because it's so under described from from that neuro perspective and that um, pubertal perspective. So no, and, and sadly, but um, certainly folks are are working on that important question. Yeah, a good question to like keep asking too, right? Exactly, keep asking, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, one question that uh, had come up, um, so you mentioned a lot about the power of rewards and mm -hmm. thinking about these heightened levels of dopamine. Um, and sometimes, um, I know I found myself in conversations where people raise questions about this idea of reward and maybe how we think about rewards. Um, you know, questions like, does that mean young people need participation trophies or sort of things like that? Could you shed a little bit more light on how we might think about the concept of rewards or activating the learning center of the brain in different or creative ways? I love this question. It, we could really talk about this for hours because there's such a deep literature on intrinsic versus versus extrinsic rewards, right? And as you might imagine, as you probably know, the intrinsic rewards are much more long lasting and meaningful than the extrinsic rewards. Um, but rather than even just thinking about, you know, the, the points and things like that, which can be affirming for some people and, and be, you know, rewarding, um, over time, those are gonna lose value. And in part, it's because the dopamine system is really clever at paying attention to things that are unexpected. So it, if you present, you know, a, a, an animal with, with a reward and that reward gets, um, or a cue that predicts a reward and that reward gets rewarded 100% of the time, over time, the dopamine response is going to diminish. But if you give that reward on a 50%, what's called a contingency schedule, that is only half the time will they get the reward the dopamine stays alert. Like, is it going to happen this time that I'm going to get the reward or not? And so not just thinking about what the reward is, but the pattern of reward is really important. And, and the adolescent brain is particularly good at getting excited about things that are unexpected. Hence, they're risk-taking, right? Because <laughs> that's the definition of risk. You don't know what's going to happen. So um, anyway, I, I, I encourage you to think about it in that way too. Yes, yes, I love. Thank you for speaking to that. Um, so there's one more question, um, and we'll probably call this our final question, though, if more come through, we'll try to answer them and follow up with folks. Um, so this person raised the question of, are there any evidence-based treatments that you're aware of that are consistent across the board that adolescents have found success with? So thinking about, is there more weight on CBT or DBT um, or different kinds of therapies that help find resilience without being placed on medication during adolescence? Uh -huh. Great question. And, and this is where the adolescent research really mirrors the adult research that no one therapy works for every everybody. And in fact, um, for anxiety in particular, if there's something, it, treatment response rates, like, you know, success in treatment is about 30% for any one treatment. And so it, this is where trial and error is actually frustrating, right? Where you have to kind of try different, different um, types of therapy to see what works. So unfortunately, no, I don't have one to know that be successful with the most adolescents. 
Thanks for speaking to that. Um, so thank you. I mean, just again, for everybody to continue to show up and be committed to this conversation and all of the nuances that exist inside this conversation around youth mental health. And thank you, Dr. Galvan, yeah, um, walking us through you. some really complex stuff and like making it make sense and, um, 